Hi, I'm Kat gillek seibert and I have a pleasure to interview Dr. Brian Williams today for my talk with Doc series uh, for my website, Doc of Clock. And Dr. Brian Williams, thank you so much for agreeing to interview. And it is such a pleasure to uh, see you again in this very different settings. And how are you? Uh, I'm doing well, Kasia. Thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here. But we could probably get this uh, schedule taken care of. It's been quite a ride. <laughs> yes, it has. Let me see if I can send you side by side. Here we go. So we are side by side now. So I like it um, much more than, you know, one likes here and the other one is huge. Right. So, uh, so Dr. Williams, let me uh, talk for a few minutes or uh, how long it takes about you because, because, you know, your resume is ballooning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure yours is pretty impressive too. Um, well, let's let's talk about it for a moment. So, you know, first first I am very interested on in people education and educational pathways. As you know, I'm a program director of Rheumatology Fellowship and looking at uh, how you got to from point A to Z and I'm sure the Z is not the end of your pathway. It's it's pretty impressive and also very intriguing. Uh, so you graduated from U.S. Air Force Academy with a um, degree in aeronautical engineering. And you were six years in active duty. And then something happened. You go to medicine and you went to the University of South Florida College of Medicine. And then, then something else happened. You had probably a nervous breakdown. And <laughs> you decided to do a general surgery. And then you went completely off the walls because you decided to do trauma. Uh, and, and now, you know, and then there was, um, I met you when I was a fresh, uh, you know, fellow in rheumatology. And you're probably not going to remember, but for me, it was very memorable a case of a woman who had a severe vasculitis and the way she was diagnosed, she actually presented to a ER with acute abdomen. And your team just explored, uh, you know, did exploratory surgery and then the biopsy showed that this is vasculitis and this was everything de novo. And she was uh, in the hospital for months on end and it was very complicated um, and, you know, in our specialties, we don't interact each other much, but that's how I met you, how I met your residents and team. And then later on, um, we ran a few times into each other uh, during the, our work. Uh, but most recently, I was actually very surprised. At first, I didn't know if this is really you or you know someone else. You were giving the uh, talk for uh, rheumatologists during the annual program director, division directors rheumatology meeting in Chicago. And what I didn't realize, right. uh, I need to stop in a minute because I think I talk too much, but this relates to. <laughs> it's your show, Kasha. You can do whatever you want. Do whatever you want. <laughs> Thank you. But you know, this relates to how I think, you know, how much is going on also with, uh, with your life. So then you are, you are inspirational speaker on a topic that is i think now even more came to the surface and you know what is part of it is upsetting brian that you keep talking about it and it, at this point you must be banking your head against the wall because you know how much can you talk and things are just changing so slowly or don't change at all and they are just too slow for comfort in my opinion um so, but let's go to the beginning. So, okay. uh, <laughs> you got me all riled up here. I can talk about so much now. I don't even know where to begin. But <laughs> I know, I know. But I do remember you, Kashi. I do remember you at UT Southwestern. Uh, we crossed, I don't remember the exact case that you're talking about, but I do remember we crossed paths uh, frequently on, on a handful full of patients. Uh, you were you were like, what, you were what we want in uh, doctors, right? To be available, affable, ability, uh, so you, you filled out all those A's. Well, yeah. That is very nice. Gosh, to hear gosh is cool. <laughs> <laughs> very nice to hear from you. And um, uh, let me let me ask you a question about your uh, military pathway. 
who inspired you to, to pursue this pathway and how did it shape you later on uh, to become a doctor and how military really makes you, I think it makes you a better doctor. And I, why won't you tell me about that a little bit? Well, I always knew from a young age that I was going into the military. I come from a lengthy line of veterans. My father was in the Air Force for 23 years. My grandfather and great-grandfather were in the military. Uh, my great-grandfather served in the World War II in the segregated units in the Pacific Theater. My grandfather served in the Korean War. My dad was active duty during Vietnam. Uh, uncles and aunts that were in the military, cousins, like we've served in all four branches of the military. So it's, it's, it's kind, of, kind of in my blood. I never questioned that I was going to go into the military. Now, I went to the Air Force Academy, which, you know, that's the Air Force version of the Naval Academy, which is Navy, and West Point, which is Army. Uh, that was the first person in my family to, to go to college and the first person to become a military officer as, as a result of that. Uh, but during that path, it was not my plan to become a doctor. I never had that as part of my life plan. I liked math, I liked science, I liked airplanes. I mean, it's all made sense. Go to the Air Force Academy, study aeronautical engineering, and then go off and do uh, testing for the, for the military, which is what I did. It was when I was on active duty, a lot of my friends were in healthcare, nurses, a few doctors, uh, but just that exposure to what they were doing is how I became uh, introduced to the field as a profession beyond my going to see the doctor, but also what the work entailed. And over a couple of years, I thought, you know, this is kind of what I think I want to do with the next phase of my life. And that's when I, I took the MCAT. This is back, this is like 1996, 95. So pre-Google days. So I went to the, the bookstore and bought the that thick MCAT prep book that's like two inches, three inches thick. And I did it cover to cover on my free time, took the MCAT, and then I was in medical school uh, the following year at the University of South Florida down in Tampa. And from there, I went to Brigham and Women's Hospital to do my res surgery residency. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, I went to Grady Hospital in Atlanta to do a fellowship in trauma and critical care. And then from there, I went to Dallas, Texas to join the faculty uh, at UT Southwestern working at Parkland Hospital as a trauma surgeon. So that whole, I mean, you know, the process is, you know, a decade more long. I was thinking it was 13 years for me from the day I set foot in medical school till I was done and practicing independently. Uh, but the, the years flew by. Just, it just, you're so busy and you're learning so much and you're having so much fun uh, that the years, the years just flew by. But being attending is great. Best job in the world. <laughs> you get to teach, uh, you get to uh, do some research, get to talk. So I'm having a blast. Yes. So... That's, you know, that's interesting that uh, your pathway is still very intriguing to me because, you know, I, I know there's a lot of uh, military doctors and there's definitely connection and, you know, a lot what I think and people may not realize it and maybe people in, that go to medical school do not realize it, but there's a lot of similarities the way we function in medicine and during residency and fellowships with this very distinctive but very palpable hierarchy who is who and right. um, you know it's a team game but if we didn't have this hierarchy i think the patient care would be compromised because you still have the the boss is the attending the faculty who has year, the years of training and you know you still look up uh, into your chiefs and and you know your older mentors so i think there is a lot of that we can draw uh, from these experiences at least the, this is the way I feel felt when I did a year of surgery. That's even more military. My right. gosh, this is just so, this was very hard. Uh, it was hard on, I was fresh from Poland here and my language wasn't so great. And I was just thrown into, you know, um, the hospital system. It was very, very hard, but also extremely rewarding. I think the year of surgery taught me so much, you know, in a sense of patient care, and people don't realize how much medicine you really re, uh, you learn during surgery. Uh, I remember distinctively how, how in the middle of the night I had to manage uh, 
uh, rapid AFib on a patient who was post-op. And I didn't sleep all night. I was looking at monitors. I was reading the chapter from the medical handbook. Uh, uh, but that helped me so much when I transitioned into medicine. And um, I want to talk to you about um, your trauma experience. And I remember how it affected me on so many levels. And I don't think that all of that was good because it's a, it's a rapid phase, a pace, it's a rapid fire situation. You've got to be on top of your game when you're waiting, you know, there's this 10, 20 minutes wait sometimes when either helicopter lands or the ambulance comes with one or multiple victims. And I remember there's such an adrenaline rush, but also a lot of, um, a lot of drama or, you know, human suffering, um, because not everybody survives. And there are people from, you know, it's not 80 year old dying. I remember distinctively 23 year old or uh, on motorcycle who said that he doesn't feel his toes and he never probably will. And uh, such situations, I remember putting chest tubes in people and you know, the blood, it's not, it wasn't pretty. And um, so how, how do you, tolerate it as a career right. right well if we're gonna get asked how we chose our specialty you probably ask like how did you choose rheumatology i am asked how did i choose trauma surgery and i tell people i didn't choose this specialty this specialty chose me uh, it was evident when i was in uh, my third year through my clinical rotations and you know, the hierarchical nature of my military service certainly played, um, uh, played some role in the fact that I think it that fit me like a glove. You talked about medicine or military making you better doctors. I think military services makes us all better persons. It makes us all better servants to yeah. society and service to humanity. You can take that sort of ethos into whatever profession uh, you choose to do, whether it be uh, public service through poli politics, business, uh, nonprofits. I, I happen to do it within the field of medicine. And um, as a third year resident, a third year medical student, during my trauma surgery rotation, during the two months on surgery, we did two, two weeks of trauma surgery on the second day, I knew, I was like, this is it. This is what I want to do. And all those things you mentioned about the, the fast pace and patients that are coming in that are injured, uh, some are dying, some do die. That was all, that all attracted me to the specialty for different reasons then than they do now, nearly 20 years later, right? Then it was about the adrenaline. It was about the fast pace. It was about making those quick decisions. Uh, and, you know, you people come in there, they're trying to die. Like they're trying to die and the team just brings them back from the brink of death. But you're right that there is a lot of suffering. There's a lot of tragedy. Uh, people do not leave their house in the morning expecting that they will die or that they will become permanently disfigured or that someone they care about will suffer the same. Right. So there's a humanistic side to trauma uh, that is very important. Like, can you relate to strangers on the worst days of their lives? Can you comfort families who do not know what is going on with their loved ones? And over time, I like to think that I've gotten better at that side of it beyond the technical part, beyond being able to operate on gunshot victims and car accident victims. Uh, and what can I do to, to bridge that gap between me and people who I may meet once in their lifetime to ensure that, look, okay, this tragic moment, which may be a defining point in your life, our team and I am here for you. We are here for your loved one. And we want to make sure that you understand that we see you for what you are. We're trying to do the best we can to return you to how you were before you were injured. So there's, there's that human element now that is much more important to me now than it was when I first got into this, this field of trauma. But as you know, also the field of general surgery changed dramatically from, you know, from perception of surgeons almost as robot and sometimes almost villains of a hospital, you know, in a sense, very strong personalities. I think there's much more humanistic approach. And I spoke with a um, sergeant who was involved in the uh, Massachusetts Medical Society 
um, meetings and you know planning and what's not and he was he, one of his roles was to emphasize this human part of the specialty of you know we not only sergeants you know masked you guys were masked before everybody else was masked um, dealing with a patient sometimes from end to end um, but also you know learning to hold hands talk to patients before but also you know in the office or on wards when they're getting better so there is much less of this te technical part of a sergeant but recognizing that we are doctors we are healers just and this is amazing that you actually just talked about all of that, what he also uh, talked to me, how it changes that, you know, we are, we are good people. We chose the specialty that for great reasons, just like you mentioned, fast paced, but also this has evolved over the years and you evolved with it, I think, as medicine did. And, you know, some of these behaviors that we've seen in medicine, let's say 20 years ago, when truly you and I trained are completely unacceptable now. Right. And that's, that's the great thing about medicine, right, is we are always learning something every day, whether it's about our specialty and changes in treatment or how we interact in a team, our, our patient demographics may be changing. So uh, it, it keeps you on your toes. And plus, if you're in academics, you know, you have a, a every year, you get a new crop of uh, residents and students and sometimes uh, nursing students wherever you're training so that keeps you on on your toes so there's or keeps me on my toes right so yeah. duties beyond the technical and uh, medical skills you've learned over time that keeps different parts to your brain sharp the creative side the uh, analytical side and the logical side and that's why I, I think being, it's, it's the most fun job I can have. It's the most rewarding job. I, well, maybe I could be an astronaut, it'd be different, but I'm not an astronaut, so <laughs> being a doctor is, is, is next in line. It's, uh, it has rewards that, that are hard to quantify, um, but every day uh, I'm excited to get up and do what I do. But I want to talk a, about your activism, and I know there was definitely a pivotal moment for you and I you know I'm a Parkland trainee and once you Parkland trainee I think there's always something you carry part of a Dallas with you and at least at least it is for me and especially that's how I look back at my training programs that you become such a they become such an important part of you and people who you meet whether it's mentors or your friends or your colleagues who are definitely support you in every aspect from professional to, uh, to personal. And, you know, so I remember the events of 2016 where about when there was this unfortunate police shooting. And, and I think that that was the very big turnaround moment for you. You happened to be on call on the, uh, on the day. I don't remember the time of the day, whether it was evening, but you were there and you, Pretty much, you know what I like about your activism, that you're looking for dialogue. And um, I think that we should, what's going on right now, I sometimes feel that we are lacking a dialogue. Uh, and I definitely feel that there should be more listening, uh, but without talking to each other, and even sometimes very difficult conversation, it is going to be very hard to move forward together. So tell me a little bit about your activism and uh, how it transformed from 2016 to now, especially after current uh, event, events, not only pandemic, but also passing of um, murder of uh, George Floyd. Right. My activism grew out of Grew, it grew in the aftermath of the July 7th, 2016 shooting, which you know, it was just actually a few days ago, the, the fourth um, anniversary of that event. And it's, it's the worst night of my career. And I still, I still think about that night every day. And it's especially around now. Um, I mean, I actually, on the day of, I shut down all news and social media i just sort of checked out uh this past wednesday uh, 
because I, you know, I knew people would be posting about it and I didn't want to be reminded about it. And I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just, I'm just saying uh, it is what it is. And it's, and it still uh, affects me to this day. Uh, but I feel an obligation to uh, try to wring some good out of this tragedy and activism in, in working towards uh, safe, constructive dialogue that leads to action mm -hmm. about the legacy of racism in our country and what that means, that's, that's a job that I feel I must do. And mm -hmm. activism means different things to different people. You, you know, you, you can be marching in the streets. Uh, you can do a, a video podcast that actually talks about racism like you're doing. Uh, you can write. There are different ways to get to get to move the needle on this divisive issue, and I, I do what I feel I can do best with authenticity, and uh, that's in line with my ethos and how I feel about how you treat people who are not like you, how you dialogue with people who are not like you, but also stay true to the same common goal, which is you know recognizing our shared humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, and be, but being truthful about the painful history in our country, what do we, what do we learn from that? It's not about shaming anyone. It is not about guilt. It is about acknowledgement and education, reconciliation and, and progress. So I talk about it and I, I go speak, as you mentioned earlier, when I spoke at the conference for the Rheumatology Society, uh, I, I write about it. I will do uh, interviews like this and I choose not to shy away from that subject. Yeah. Uh, but you know, if you, if you want to step into this, recognize that I am not openly embraced <laughs> by mm -hmm. everyone because of this. I, most, of the, most of the feedback is positive, but there are those who will call me a sellout uh, because I don't do my activism in a certain way. There are those I've been called a racist for even talking about this. Uh, I've been told to, well, you're a doctor. You, you do doctoring, you don't talk about this sort of things. Mm -hmm. um, but that just shows you how important it is to actually continue to push this dialogue, yeah. right? Because if we're afraid yeah. to discuss it, that yeah. says something. Uh, yeah. And that's where you need, like, you need to turn the, the spotlight on that and say, okay, why is that? What is it about that that is, wants you to silence the discussion? Because there is the opportunity for connection there is the opportunity for growth and there's opportunity for us to really uplift our society and for people like you and I that have, you know, you and I both have privilege, right? We have privilege based on our professions, our, our income, our education. Uh, if you have privilege based on your race, we can use that to speak on behalf of those who the general society may not uh, view with credibility may not want to hear from, may want to keep marginalized, but if we push the conversation on their behalf with credibility uh, and with the consistency, then there is a possibility for change. So that's why I continue, that's why I call myself an activist and that's why I, I do what I do. And I, 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 mean, I feel energized by it because I feel it's in line with what I mean, what it means to be a doctor, right? Mm -hmm. Doctors, we serve humanity. No matter what our specialty is, we are somewhat in service to others, and by my activism, I'm doing the exact same thing. Yeah, and I, I noticed also, so going, you know, I, I, as I said at the beginning, your resume, you can't just um, summarize it in three sentences, and uh, what you did most recently, it's, it's really, really, really cool. Um, you have a podcast. And it's called Raised Violence and Medicine. And you're actually doing very similar thing that we're doing right now. Uh, obviously, your topic is very specific and you talk to specific people. Uh, but that's very interesting, you know, this dialogue that you have. Uh, and you talk about topics that are important to you. And I think, I think it's great because, you know, um, we need to have this recognition that those, those are, there are specific topics that are going to be uh, of interest to you. And we have to respect it. It's just like, you know, me being a woman and program director and director of a division, you know, I want to have a voice during the uh, meetings that are mostly male uh, predominant. And you have to find your voice and you have to keep on doing that and changing the dialogue around it 
But I think the most important, Brian, what needs to happen, and I think it happened in a way for you, is to have a seat at the table. <laughs> right, right. You, that's, that, that is so important, is having a seat at the table. And there's a saying that uh, if you're not sitting at the table, that means you're on the menu. Something, something to that effect, right? Yeah. Uh, if, you're, if you're not in the room when important decisions are being made about X, for instance, who, is, who will be accepted to your uh, fellowship program? Yes. Who will be accepted into medical school? Who will be promoted from assistant to associate professor? Uh, if you're not in there when those decisions are being made and there is a lack of diversity of thought and experience, then that will impact who gets these opportunities to, uh, to, to advance. And it seems like a, a simple thing, but, but it's not. if you have a chance to be at the table and you do not take that chance, you can never be heard. And you talk about July 7th, it's, it's such a seminal event for me because July 7th is one part, but July 11th, which was when there was a press conference that was going to talk mm -hmm. about this uh, event, that's when I was given the chance to have a seat at the table. And when I was asked to go to the press conference, I initially said, no, I do not want to be yeah. there. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it was the worst out of my life, and I did not want to be reliving it on camera four days after this event. Yep. And my wife was one and said, Brian, you have to go. You just have to go there and just sit there so the cameras can see a black person, a black surgeon, a black male trauma surgeon was there that night trying to save these police officers who were, who were shot by a black sniper at a, a Black Lives Matter protest. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's, there's all of that that was going on at that time. And it was also 2016, Kasha, which was leading up to the election between Clinton and Trump. So it's a very uh, toxic time. She said, you know, you have, to be, you have to go to the table and sit there. And if I had not taken my seat at the table, you and I would not be having this discussion right now, right? Because I had to be there, was one. And then I had to speak up, which was the second part, which happened impromptu uh, because I felt that what was being said did not address uh, some root causes of the violence that occurred that night. And uh, when I spoke up, that's when things changed. So you're right, you have to have a seat at the table. And if you have a seat at the table, take it. And if you're at the table, use your voice. Just like you said, Kasha, use your voice. You think people may not care, you think it may not make a difference, but you'll be surprised how what you say may resonate. Yeah, you know, and I think that something happened in a pandemic that completely, you know, now when I sit at the table, I have so many comments, I have so many, you know, <laughs> uh, it's, just, it's just a little overwhelming. And, you know, sometimes I think, oh my gosh, I talk too much. But as you said, you know, if you have something to say, you don't want to become a nuisance, but you definitely should demand almost that you are being heard and right. that you don't you know you know your voice is not uh subdued or ignored or and i think it's a long road ahead brian and i right. think it's a long road ahead for medical women and for people from different backgrounds as you know you know i i recently completed um read two books um of obama's of michelle and Barack, and I loved those books, and I really think that they complement each other, and I like so much both of them, very charismatic and smart people with enormous intelligence, and I remember a particular um, sentence from uh, Barack's Obama books, and he talks about racial scarring, that it's not something, you know, you can just change from day one to the other, and you know that there is this scar that happens that shapes you and shaped him definitely and him being from a mixed background he particularly not only seen both sides of being white and black at the same time but also how much his attitude is important and what he does is important and how he's going to be judged and michelle also emphasizes it how much she's every time she spoke every time she even put an outfit on she says i'm going to be judged not because 
I have this education, I, ha I am a lawyer, I'm a wife of a president, but because I'm a woman and I'm a black woman, and this is, um, those are such powerful messages. And uh, tell me a little bit about how you refer to that, how uh, being a black male, very well educated, and how did it affect you in your choices or in your daily life? Well, I, I like that term that you use, uh, racial scarring. I've, I've used the term racial battle fatigue, uh, and it's definitely shaped me my, my entire life. I would say that even as a young child, the, the uh, indoctrination, if you will, began even before I was old enough to recognize that it was happening. And it was because of that, recognizing that uh, being a black male it, it it carries with it a certain amount of power, uh, you know, the power to invite hate for some reasons, uh, power to cause fear, but also uh, the power to, to, to do good and make a difference is by representation. Uh, so, you know, on a semi-conscious level, I recognize that that was always with me. And, and up until the July 7, 2016, that's when things kind of changed. Because at that time, my life, gosh, I was actually thinking about these things that you're asking me about right now, like how uh, that impacted me. And I recognize that, yeah, I was not living to be my true self. I was not living out my ethos. Uh, I was compartmentalizing very important parts of my identity in order to assimilate into society. But because of that, I could not provide my full gifts <laughs> to. Uh, to my profession, to my friends and colleagues, and, and, and to humanity. Uh, I was doing enough, but I knew I could, I could do more. And it doesn't matter what, what I step into that. And after July 7th, there was just no choice. I just realized, like, Brian, there, the day before that, Philando mm -hmm. Castile was killed. You have to do something. And here we are four years later, and George Floyd happens. So you, so you have to wonder, like you said, things move so slowly. Yeah. Um, but if we don't make the effort to speak up, to take our seats at the table, to, uh, to use our voice, then there will be no change. And yes, it is glacial. But right now is a moment where it seems like there's so many people talking about it, so many people willing to speak up, mm -hmm. that we're kind of at this uh, moment where I hope, I hope that this is a tipping point where we don't go back. Uh, but I'm waiting, Kasha. I'm still <laughs> a bit skeptical because we've been here before, but it, it does feel like this time is different. Yeah. And, you know, I think that what it needs to happen, Brian, is we need to chip away a little bit at a time. And I think, you know, uh, to put posters and, you know, that's one thing. Um, I think the support is very important to recognize which side you want. I think it's super important, but I think it has to be the action. And that's why I remember when I send you a question for this interview, one of them is, do you ever speak for children? Because I think, Brian, it's, it has to happen before you reach adulthood, especially for certain segments of our society. I look at, uh, you know, we both have kids and for our kids, it is going to be a lot much more natural than for some adults. But I think if we don't bridge this gap very early across the country, this is going to be very difficult to catch up with a man who is 40 and established and has certain ways and he always voted certain way. And so uh, how do you think, how do we chip away? And I know it starts at the selection process, let's say um, at various, you know, at the interviews uh, for medical schools, because we have to do what we, we do in our, you know, we're not in a silo, but, you know, I can't, I, or I don't want to be a politician suddenly or what's not. And I think it should happen within our, within where we are, within our environment. And how do you, so what do you think is the most important things for us to do? What kind of dialogue should we shape in? Well, yeah, you asked about speaking to children. I think that's very important. And I do actually, just a couple of weeks ago, I did um, something like this with one of my colleagues, 
from the Air Force, Colonel Lockhart, who was actually a NASA astronaut. He has a sh he has a show, and actually the link is posted on my website at brianwilliamsmd.com. But his audience is nine to fourteen year olds. So we had a discussion about courage and social justice that was age appropriate. And I agree with you that getting to the children uh, is very important. And but here's a here's a company thing. And like the kids nowadays, and I and I say kids from you know my daughter who's nine years old to to youngsters that are now in college. Yeah. Uh, to call them kids is diminishes who they are, what they really do, because they are very socially aware mm. and very uh, socially courageous, more so than I ever was, uh, I mean, even five or six years ago. So, and they've grown up in, uh, they grew up with Obama, right? They, they saw how that president came towards himself. They grew up during the Trump years. So they've seen just a whiplash spectrum of how society can work. And that's forming their vision of the world, right? So as they grow older and start interacting, like they're gonna take all that, and I'm very excited to see what will, will uh, come of that. Like the, the kids, <laughs> uh, they will change uh, the world, and I do believe it will be for the better. Uh, and you tell them now, even though it's a scary time, you know, my daughter, she talked about the coronavirus. Uh, she knows that I'm a trauma surgeon, and she knows I take care of gun violence victims. But you know, in her mind, she sometimes thinks that I am actually in the line of fire at at work. So I realize that the, the world to her is a, still a scary place. So dialoguing with her and talking about things all the time is important. When I talk to her, I think about other parents who may need to do the same thing. So talking to kids is one, but I don't think talking to parents. Uh, is is not effective. They may be set in their ways, mm -hmm. but they're still raising kids, and and minds can be changed and and altered. Uh, just like you said, just chip away a little bit at a time, and, and, and not give up. Yeah. So um, you know, you're doing so much stuff. You know, your work, um, trauma sergeant, being a sergeant in general. It's so busy, and you have definitely, you know, after hours. Uh, your pod, podcast and you also writing columns for Chicago Tribune and you also contributed to Dallas Morning News uh, back when you were in Texas and first of all how do you find time for all of that and the second part of this question is how do you rest because part of you know what I'm doing on my website is very it's very much about balance and nutrition and you know singing and creating right, art right. so uh, how how do you yeah, check out your website i like yes. your website it's on it's on my list now <laughs> oh really <laughs> yes please yeah. look at it yeah you can contribute also so tell me a little bit about it so when we talk about work-life balance i i prefer the term work-life integration and to an outside observer I know it seems like I'm doing a lot and I, and I never have any downtime, mm -hmm. but for me, I feel that everything I do is, is now integrated, which it was not in the past. Now everything I do is, is focused on one goal of serving humanity and an uplifting society. Mm -hmm. So as a trauma surgeon on Chicago South side, dealing with gun violence and, and uh, marginal community I'm doing my part uh, and I'm, when I'm interacting with the community when I'm not that are dealing with violence uh, that's working towards the same goal when I write I'm talking about racial justice when I go speak I'm talking about racial justice my podcast I talk about these issues of race and violence and medicine like and how they all integrate and I, you know, I work very hard to make my wife and daughter a priority uh, and I, I'm not gonna say I'm perfect about that. I, I know that uh, uh, I could do better in that respect, but I do things like us today. Uh, we uh, record the podcast early in the morning, so I don't take away from their time, but I'm also at work today. So today was easy because I'm at work. Yeah, um, yeah. I do my writing uh, late at night. Uh, so I, I probably could do a better job of getting more, more sleep, uh, but I, try my best to not do, you know, outside of my family, the things I do are, are not wasteful time. 
So it's kind of focused on four things. My family, uh, my physical fitness. I do a lot of reading. And then the, the whole social justice part, which involves the writing and the, the speaking and things, things like that. So uh, I feel like everything's integrated. Mm-hmm. And I'm doing my best to try to ensure that it doesn't negatively impact my my family. But there's always room for improvement. Yes. So, uh, I, but I feel energized. I, I don't feel tired. I don't feel burdened. I don't feel like it's a it's a job. It's just yeah. this is how I exist. I get up, and I'm thinking about making the world a better place. Before I go to bed, I say I hope I did one thing that day that moved the needle in a positive direction. And the next day, I get up and do the same thing. You know, it, I, I love what you said about integration because, you know, part of what I'm doing and it's really, it's been very slow change in medicine. Uh, it's, as you know, it's a very conservative field, however you look at it. And to, you know, I, I love the integrate, integrative um, medical aspect of care, having chiropractor and acupuncture is part of the team decision-making and I like how you said it. It's, it's, I'm going to think more about it, uh, about thinking about not so much work-life balance, but integration and making it seamless. Uh, I really like it. So let me think about it a little bit, how I will use it, uh, <laughs> not only in my personal life, but also in training of my fellows. Um, right. But I'd like to hear from you. So I am reading right now the book about how to be healthier, like next year better. It's for aging people, you know, and one of the things that is being repeated, repeated multiple times is the fitness and physical exercise. So tell me about your routine. How do you take care of your health? Like specifically, what do you do? So I have a, mind body type of a uh, routine so i meditate most nights and do that with my daughter uh, when i can get her to sit down for, <laughs> for a little bit but we meditate together and even just just for a couple of minutes three to four mm-hmm. minutes just try to tune everything out um i, I do that uh i i read a lot my because my mind is just constantly going so i read not only for my for ed- education I read a lot of nonfiction, but also read a lot of science fiction for escape. But it's also to just kind of reset my my brain. It's like it's like the control alt delete, <laughs> where mm-hmm. I can just go off and yeah. do some do something else. And then there is a physical activity. Uh, used to go to the gym every day. That has been limited, obviously, yeah. because of COVID. Mm-hmm. So now it's a, it's a bunch of push-ups, mm-hmm. in you know, at, at home or in the office, planks and go out walking or running with my mask on always wear your mask <laughs> yeah so that's what i've limited it to now oh, and yeah. try to try to eat as healthy as possible like what we put mm-hmm. in our body is more important uh so important to our health and that um, for me they definitely need some work it's been easy to uh to do a lot of food or an uber eats during the pandemic and uh as opposed to eating as healthy as i, I would like to so yeah. Yeah, but i say you know definitely- mind and body so do you so you know the healthiest formula formula is six days a week about 35 to 45 minutes of cardio exercise so i'm gonna ask you are you close to that so yeah i have actually redefined i saw an article about redefining uh your physical activity, re- redefining exercise. Because uh, you say, am I doing 35 minutes? You, you envision, okay, am I at the gym doing 35 minutes on the elliptical? Or am I out running for 30, 35 minutes? And this article actually liberated me in a lot because I thought, okay, when I'm on a call, I mean, I can walk a few, I can walk a few miles in the hospital <laughs> between yes. seeing consults and going to the OR and being on my yeah. feet. So, can I count that as physical activity? And I'll yes. say, yes, if most people are sedentary at home, you know, 80% of the time sitting in front of the TV, I would, cons- I would call that physical activity. Yeah. Uh, so and to answer your question is, yes, between, if I count that plus the times I was going to the gym or I'm out, or I'm out uh, you know, outside going for a run or for a walk, I'm getting the 35 minutes. Now, it's not all high intensity. Yeah. Uh, the intensity can be uh, bumped up. And I'm probably not making the six days a week for that, but I'm getting something every single day. No doubt. 
Yeah. And I think it's important, you know, to talk about it because uh, I think, you know, it's so easy to get lost in our work. And now with the pandemic, I think that it's such an anxiety provoking time. And, uh, and I, I am really, masking is very important. I, I mask, um, you know, I have a mask all the time on almost and whether it's super healthy for your skin and, you know, I end up being very congested, but you know, you have to do it and you have to set example for your patients, for your family, for your loved ones. Um, so another thing that I want to talk to you about is you said um, this balance and this mind-body connection. Why don't we see more men doing yoga in the organized classes? And I'm talking about the time, obviously, before pandemic, but even now, I did a few classes, you know, outside yoga when you spaced properly. So what do you think is about that that is not appealing to men? I don't know that it's, you know, I've taken yoga in the past and our classes I went to were, we had male instructors and I would say probably about 20% of the class was male. So I, I don't have any personal experience with it being uh, a lack of male interest. Um, but if I were just to, to speculate, you know, it, it may not seem to be a manly activity, right? To do poses and be on the mat and wear tight fitting clothing. Uh, I mean, we are we are socialized that men are to do aggressive types of activities. You play organized sports, uh, you lift weights, mm -hmm. uh, but, but those are those are societal uh, definitions. Mm -hmm. uh, but we don't need to place those sort of expectations on ourselves, right? If, uh, I think it takes more courage and um, be more confident in who you are as a person to be willing to say, yeah, I get something out, out of yoga. And heck, if I'm the only guy in the room, I'm the only guy in the room. And for me, when I do go, I'm usually the only black guy in the room, yeah, right? So, right. Uh, you know, I'm dealing doubly with the gender and the, uh, the, uh, my, my race, yeah. or racial identity. So. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, and, you know, I, I think yeah. it's just, you know, society, but I, I, my experience has been, has been not that bad when it comes to men doing yoga. Yeah. And I, I think it's part what you, what you touched upon is that we really have a different expectations. You know, when, uh, when you look at what men health magazine has, it's always push-ups, you know, it's in the gym. It's really some strength building resistance. And definitely, you know, I think if we had a little bit more of the seamless connection or learning from each other. I think much more women would, would really benefit from strength training or resistant exercises. And I think we also would have much balanced, uh, more balanced society if more men were doing yoga or this mind-body connection. Um, so maybe next time when we interview, we'll do yoga together. White woman and a black man doing yoga. <laughs> I, I think this is going to be, this is going to be a breakthrough. Completely mind-boggling. I've lost all my flexibility, but yeah, that'll be good. I need to get back into it on a regular basis. It's so sporadic yes. now. Yes. It's, uh, it's, it's embarrassing. My, my so, legs are like two by fours. Hi. <laughs> so, you know, it's going to be good experience for me, and you're going to be like uh, possibly embarrassed. And uh, But, you know, that's, that's, <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing. We have to, part of it is chipping away of these preconceptions. And I, I love the dialogue. Right. And, um, and, and it's, there's so much difficult conversation happening right now about pandemic and protesting. And I feel people will do what they feel is right. But I think where you and I are sitting, we should teach people. And, you know, I don't want to sound too authoritative, but we have a knowledge through 20 years of formal education to provide people with great information and I think dialogue between various races and genders and life experiences, I think it can only be advantages, not only for us, you know, talking today together, but also to whoever wants to click a button and watch this video or some, some of your podcasts, uh, which, uh, which I'm definitely right. looking forward to exploring um, your podcasts. Yeah, I just, I just posted episode 80. So we're closing in on 100 episodes here soon. Wow. So. 
I didn't know. I didn't know that there is so many. I noticed that you started long time ago, a few years ago. That's so check it out. Race, 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 balance and medicine. It's yep. available anywhere you get podcasts. I have it. I have Apple, it. Yeah. It's Apple definitely Podcasts, on my Spotify, bucket list. Anywhere. <laughs> bucket list. I like it's, that. It is race, on my bucket <laughs> list. Um, and you know, I want to, I want to finish. I don't want to keep you away from your, um, from your, you know, duties as a, as a sergeant right now working and also, you know, connecting back with your family and maybe some other things that you want to do on Sunday. Um, but you know, what do you think? Even well, today if you... my family is, uh, the, the residents and nurses in the hospital. That's my family today. Oh, okay. Here we go. Yes. Yes. Yeah, thank you for thank you for pointing that out because I think that's very important. We truly spend more time at work sometimes than at home, and it's best if your team is becoming your family, and and they do, and they definitely do. Williams, thank you so much for this uh, opportunity to talk to you, uh, and I would like to consider it as just the beginning of our dialogue. I I found conversation with you first of all easy, but also very educational. And I really feel that we have a, all have a role to play. And uh, thank you for what you're doing. And I love the talk and um, at the conference that we had. It was, it was memorable to the point, but remember we were talking, I'd like to invite you to Providence and to the Brown system. And um, so thank you again. And I really wish that you have a nice day and um, let's keep doing what we're doing. And the, the things matter. I think these things matter really. No, thank you for inviting me. I had fun today, Kasha, and I also want to invite your uh, your audience. They can contact me at my website, brianwilliamsmd.com. I spell Brian with an I, and you email me. It has my social media tags. If you DM me, I will get back to you. I look forward to continuing the conversation. That's brianwilliamsmd.com. Hopefully have you back again sometime soon, Kasha. This was fun. This was Thank fun. you so much.